Hello, everyone. Welcome to PostgreSQL Observed and Explained. I'm Stacey Hazler. I'm the CFO and COO at PGX, the Postgres Consultancy in Alameda, California, just across the bay from San Francisco. I'm president of PGUS, one of the organizers of San Francisco Bay Area Pug, and I am most definitely not an engineer. Sorry. Sorry. We can't both be in charge of the controls. <laughs> And I'm Karen Jex. I'm a senior solutions architect at Crunchy Data, which, as you can see from that diagram of my career so far, I come to from a background as a database administrator and then a database consultant. I also wear a couple of different hats in the community. I'm a PostgreSQL Europe board member and chair of the recently formed Postgres Europe Diversity Committee. <laughs> we'll get it by the end. We'll get it by the end. So why this talk? Um, a few years ago on the bird site. Sorry. Yep. There you go. <laughs> we'll get it by the end. It's fine. Um, I was venting about being approached by yet another recruiter who had a Postgres engineer job that they knew I would be a perfect fit for because all they'd done is look at my LinkedIn profile and seeing the PGX Postgres in my um, company name. And so I thought, well, is my Postgres knowledge? What have I learned in all these years of going to conferences and sitting in on the company staff meetings and reading client email? So I thought, well, let me put it in a tweet. I know all these things. That's kind of cool. And my knowledge is so extensive, it required two tweets to encompass it all. So I got a reply from none other than Magnus Lagander. Great. Okay, I'm going to go work at RPL. Moving to Sweden. No, wait, no, no, that doesn't work. But I thought that was encouraging. Maybe I do know a few things about Postgres. So fast forward to 2024, Karen invited me to co-present the Barbie talk at PG Day Chicago. And that was a great experience, even wearing a very pink dress. Working together was terrific. When the CFP for EU opened, Karen suggested working together again. Of course I said yes. Then we had to figure out what we were actually going to present because neither of us were doing up for doing the Barbie talk again. I mentioned an idea I'd had about doing a lightning talk based on those tweets. The idea of it even being a non-technical person, being in the community, you pick up a lot of useful knowledge, even if it would take a technologist to explain the why and how. Karen said it sounded like a great idea. Here we are. So I get to be the not so glamorous assistant or maybe the rabbit pulled out of the hat to do the technical explanations of all this extensive Postgres knowledge that Stacey's talking about. Um, the technical explanations won't necessarily go very deep because some of them would take a several day training course to actually go through. Uh, but I will include links to documentation as we go along. And I, as always, encourage people to try things out and have a play. <laughs> so first thing auto vacuum leave auto vacuum on auto vacuum is not causing whatever problem you are having however turning it off will cause a problem just ask our client who ignored our warnings for months they ended up in wraparound on a saturday morning one of our staff logged nearly 11 hours fixing everything and restoring it to functionality the client paid doubly our bill for emergency services on a Saturday, and the loss of 10 hours of revenue while their site was unavailable. Okay, so the docs describe auto vacuum as an optional but highly recommended feature, and I'm not sure that really states it strongly enough. It's enabled by default, and really, you probably want to leave it enabled. If you've got a performance issue, you might look at what's using up resources in uh, your database and you'll see some auto vacuum processes running. Aha, you might think that's what's slowing things down. So I'll just switch auto vacuum off and everything will speed up. Please don't do that. Unless you've got some very clever processes in place to make sure that your tables are being vacuumed as needed, you could end up as Stacy's client having to perform some costly offline maintenance down the road. 
What does AutoVacuum actually do? Well, it launches AutoVacuum processes that check for tables that have had a large number of inserted, updated, or deleted rows, and it executes vacuum or analyze as needed. So vacuum is described in the documentation as a garbage collector. It reclaims the storage that's occupied by dead tuples or rows in your tables. And unless you're using a vacuum full, it doesn't take an exclusive lock, so it doesn't prevent reads or writes. If you want to see what auto vacuum is doing, if you set log auto vacuum min duration to zero, you'll see every time it runs and what it's doing. And uh, from version 15, it's actually a pretty verbose output, so it will give you lots of information. Just note that even if you disable auto vacuum, you cannot stop it running on any table where it's needed to prevent transaction ID wraparound. So you do still need things to happen, and that could then take a much, much longer time if it's forced to do it. So rather than switch it off, if you do find that auto vacuum is using too many resources or it's not running as you expect it to, there are various different things you can do to tune it. These are just some of the parameters that you could change if you want to change that behavior. You can change the number of processes that run, so by default that's three. You can change how long between each run, by default that's one minute. You can define how many tuples should be updated, deleted, or inserted before vacuum or analyze is triggered. You can specify a percentage of the rows in the table that should be added to those amounts to take account for larger tables. You can specify the age in transactions before a vacuum's forced to prevent the transaction ID wraparound that we talked about. Uh, you can specify how long the processes should run for um, before they sleep for a while or how much they um, should process before they sleep for a while. Uh, and all of those things will allow you to have quite fine-grained control over those processes. Next. 98% disk space use is bad. People don't work well when too many of us are packed into one space. Your database won't work well if too much is packed onto one disk. So databases need some space. Your data is going to grow, your wall will accumulate, Postgres will create temporary files, whether that's for uh, joint queries or maintenance operations. If your data directory fills, you won't be able to write. You won't be able to insert or update or create a table, for example. And you're going to get this kind of error. You're going to have to do something about that. If it's the disk containing the write ahead logs, the wall that's full, then that's more serious. Postgres will do a panic shutdown to protect your database. And in that case, you don't have a choice but to immediately make some space. And if you're thinking at this point, it's fine, I'll just delete some of the older wall files, I don't need them anymore, please don't do that. Postgres needs the wall files. If you delete them, you risk not being able to restart your database and needing to restore from a backup. So what do you do if you're already in that situation where you've got 98, 100% disk space? Well, whether it's the data directory or your wall directory, add some space. Adding some space will always buy you some time to figure out what else is going on. If it's the data, data directory, there might be things in there that you can remove, but be extremely careful before you do that. Make sure they really are things you don't need. And if it's the wall, the most common thing is make sure your wall archiving is working. The most common reason for your wall directory filling up is because those walls aren't being copied off to your backup area and therefore Postgres is holding on to them because it knows they're still needed. So if you, once you make sure that's working, the walls will start being archived, it will clear out the old ones and you'll have some space. Uh, to avoid that kind of disk full issue, make sure you've got monitoring and alerting place. Keep an eye on how much space you've got in your data directory, in your wall directory. Have alerts that maybe just tell you every so often, hey, just to let you know there's 75% uh, usage in your data directory. And then slightly more urgent ones that say, come on now, your disk's 95% full, you really need to fix this. Backups. Have redundant backups. If you have only one backup, you do not have any backups. 
Now, see, I agree with Stacey on almost all of the points in this presentation, but actually I've had to help out a few customers recently that did not have any backups at all and they were in a database down situation and that was terrifying. So it turns out even if you've only got one backup, you're actually already ahead of the game. But if the data in your database is important to you, you want to be able to recover it if something goes wrong. And for that, you want to take backups. And yes, backups plural, because it is an ongoing thing rather than a one-off activity. And you want to test your restores. You may already heard of the Schrodinger's backup concept. The concept condition of any backup is unknown until a restore is attempted. Not only that, but if you have to restore, it's going to be an emergency. It's going to be the middle of the night. There'll be managers and users breathing down your neck. And Fred, who wrote the restore procedures, probably left the company last year. You want to test and practice your restore process regularly so that you're confident you know how to do it and you know that it's going to work. Foreign data wrappers. Foreign data wrappers are terrifically useful. You need a phrase book when you're traveling in a country where you don't speak the language. Your database does too. SQL Med unfortunately has nothing to do with holidays on the Mediterranean. It's a protocol that lets you communicate with other types of data or databases using regular SQL queries from the comfort of your own PostgreSQL database. There are lots of different types of foreign data wrapper available to you in Postgres. You've got foreign data wrappers that let you connect to other databases. So generic database wrappers, wrappers for SQL databases, NoSQL databases, big data and column oriented databases. But also you've got web wrappers, geo wrappers, file wrappers and more. But it's also worth remembering that even data in another Postgres database is foreign. So um, databases within a Postgres cluster are separate. Here, if Athena connects to the Acropolis database, he can't run queries against tables in the Agora or Parthenon databases. She would need to use a foreign data wrapper, in this case, Postgres FTW probably. And this can also be used to access databases in a separate Postgres cluster. And if out of all of those available foreign data wrappers, there isn't one that suits your needs, you can always write your own. There's a whole chapter in the documentation that tells you how you can do that. Indexes and primary keys. They solve a lot of problems. Make sure each of your tables has a primary key. You'll be quite unhappy later if you don't because everything is going to run much slower than it could. For example, you have read a book, something stuck in your head. You want to reread just that page. Reading the entire book again, or even skimming the pages, would take more time than you have. Fortunately, the book has an index. You can look up the specific term, find the page number, go directly to that page to reread the information you're looking for. Okay, we're gonna use one of my favorite examples to illustrate the importance of primary keys and index, coffee and cake. So imagine you're storing data for a small chain of coffee shops in Athens. You've got a coffee shops table that contains your store locations and a state sales table that records your transactions, date, quantity, product, and store location. There are a few reasons that you'd want a primary key for your coffee shops table. Firstly, what if you opened another store in Kolonaki? If I talk about the Kolonaki store, how do you know which one I mean? How do you know which store that second transaction took place in? Is it the first or the second Kolonaki store? You need a way to uniquely identify a coffee shop or uniquely identify a row in your table. You could add street address, store name, or some other identifying information to your coffee shop's table and use a combination of columns to uniquely identify a row. So I could talk about the coffee shop um, called the Sunny Cafe in Plaka or the coffee shop on Vuku Restu in Kolonaki. So that name, location, and street could be your natural primary key. But using that combination of columns as your primary key can get pretty unwieldy. For one thing, you'd also need to add all of that information to your coffee shop's table if you want to know which shop a sales belongs to. 
So most systems use surrogate or artificial primary keys instead because they're much easier to work with and they take up less space. So in this case, we can add a oh dear, numeric, easy for me to say, uh, add a numeric store ID to the coffee shop's table and use that to uniquely identify each row. Now that we've got a primary key for our coffee shop's table, we can include that store ID as a foreign key, a reference to a parent table in our sales table. And similarly, we can add a transaction ID as the primary key in the coffee shop, sale, coffee shop sales table. So we've got a way to differentiate two rows that otherwise look the same. So for example here, transactions 101 and 104 would look the same if we didn't have that unique identifier. So primary key is a column or multiple columns that allows you to uniquely identify a row in a table. It can be a natural or a surrogate key. The uniqueness is enforced through the primary key constraint and a unique index. A table can only have one primary key constraint. You can create additional unique constraints. And you need a primary key on your parent table if you want to create foreign key constraints that refer to it. As Stacy said, indexes can speed up table searches. So let's imagine some more data in your coffee shop sales table. This is probably just a small extract, of course, of that data, and you'd probably sell lots of different products rather than just these three. If you want to look up all the sales of Greek coffee, so Elinikos Cafes, then without an index, Postgres is going to need to go through all of the entries in the table to find out whether or not the product is Greek coffee. It might take a while to scan through each row of the table to check if it matches. To avoid that, you can create an index on the product column, which, a bit like in the book, is an ordered list of entries containing a value and a pointer to the table row, the row ID. In a lot of cases, it will be faster to go to the Greek coffee section of the index, identify the row IDs, and go directly to the relevant rows in the table itself than it would to scan the whole table. And as a bonus, if you just want to do something like count the number of Greek coffee sales, Postgres wouldn't even need to access the table. All of the information you need is in the index itself. So indexes can be created on one or more columns. Uh, you can create them on column expressions, so you might create one on lower um, lowercase value of your column ID, uh, two columns concatenated, some kind of uh, calculation based on your columns, etc. There are lots of different types of index in Postgres that I've listed there. They're useful for different types of data and different types of query. The default type and the one that I gave a very simplistic diagram of on the previous slide is the B tree, the balance tree. You also have things like partial indexes. If you've only got a part of your table that you need to access via an index, you can just index that part. That saves you space and maintenance time. So if you don't need to index your whole table, you don't need to. Um, you could also have covering indexes. So that um, index only scan that I described previously, where you don't have to go to the table because all of the data is in your index, you can actually add some indexes into you add some columns into your index that are there just to keep that data clustered with your index. Testing. Test the upgrade before you put it into production. We've had clients who have not done this. I assure you, it goes badly. Using your production server as a test environment really doesn't make anybody happy. Try it and see what happens. It's for making changes to recipes in your kitchen, not your production server. I don't think I need to say much more on this one, but this is one of my favorite uh, quotes here. Everybody has a testing environment. Some people are lucky enough to have a totally separate environment to run production in. And be sure you are testing on the test server. Before running the test, double check. Check again. Check again one more time before starting. Every DBA has a horror story that starts something along the lines of, I thought I was on the test server. Version upgrades. Minor version upgrades are just as important as major ones. Two words, 
Security fixes. So these are just, oh, that's, got ahead of myself there. Stacy's place. Well, no, 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 no. It's, it's, you're the expert here. Well, just an example of this, here are security related fixes in the version 16 minor releases. So really security matters. Okay, first, what is a major or minor version? The docs explain the Postgres numbering, um, but if we ignore pre-version pre 10, which I'm hoping nobody's still using, the major version is to the left of the point, and the minor version is to the right of the point. If you want to know when you can expect a new release, you can look at the roadmap. So as a minimum, you'll get a minor release quarterly for all supported versions. So that's the five most recent versions. And a major, a major version will be released each year, usually in September. Many users insist that they have to stay on a specific minor release of Postgres. But the documentation and the community are really clear about the fact that it really is recommended to run the latest minor release for a given major version. Rather than an upgrade, just think of moving to a new minor version as applying a patch. It's quick and easy to do, and it doesn't introduce new functionality. It just fixes bugs and security issues. And yet more customers insist that they have to stay on a particular major version of Postgres. And some of this is because they're using third-party software that's only certified on certain releases. And in those cases, I'd suggest that those third-party vendors probably need to be gently encouraged to certify their product on the latest versions of Postgres. But also a lot of it is a fear of upgrades which is somewhat understandable. If you only do a major upgrade once every five years, given the rate of turnover in most companies, it's quite likely that you don't have anyone on the team who's ever done it before. It's much better to upgrade regularly. So it's just a regular maintenance activity and it's much less scary. Next up, queries. Your super cool custom query is likely a source of your problems. We've had this conversation with so many clients who insist it, it simply can't be. We have this, which is only a very small part of a query. It's actually too large to fit on the slide, even in six point font. If you could see my screen, you would see it going down past the floor. Yep. A query, fancy, it looks great but it doesn't run well. We tuned a query for a client recently. Simply pasting it took almost two minutes to process and the runtime was even worse. Tuning brought the total time down to 22 milliseconds. So tidy up your queries. A lot of application developers will be using an ORM, an object relational mapping tool, which abstracts the interaction between the database and the programming language. And that abstraction can be a good and a bad thing. It simplifies the interaction and makes it easier to generate queries, but it also means that you don't necessarily understand, have control over or knowledge of what's going on in the database when the query is executed. If a query is performing badly, it's important to be able to look at it and understand what it's doing, and also to have a look at how Postgres is actually executing it in the background. If um, this, sorry, this is a query on our coffee shops table that generates a simple annual sales report. The de details of this query really aren't important. The thing I want to show you is that if you just add explain analyze to the beginning of the query. So the analyze uh, keyword is optional. That will actually make it run, run your query so that you get real um, statistics rather than just um, what it's planning to do. So if you add explain analyze to the beginning of your query, you'll get an execution plan that looks like this. Execution plans can seem scary at first, and I'm absolutely not expecting you to read this. But the main thing that I always want people to know is how to read an execution plan. 
you read it from the most indented to the least indented. The indented steps feed in to the step above. Oh, I need to stop touching that. The indented steps feed into the step above that's slightly less indented. Only if you have two steps at the same level of indentation do you read them from top to bottom. And you'll also start to look out for things like external merge. So that would be where Postgres is having to create a temporary file, potentially because it's not got enough memory to do the work you're asking it to do. Um, or sequential scans, which mean that the whole table is being scanned rather than using an index. And there are also, I haven't linked them here, but there are also some graphical tools that people have created because a lot of people do find this kind of wall of text very difficult to read and understand. So you can plug your um, query or your execution plan in and it will give you some kind of visual diagram um, so that you can see how each of those steps are feeding into each other. Your application. The problem isn't always the database. It's quite often the application, although again, the client will say, oh, there is absolutely nothing wrong with our application. This is an excerpt from an actual meeting we had with a client. I'm not making this up. Um, poker face only goes so far. Sometimes you hear things that just you can't help but express your shock. So as most people in this room probably already know, Postgres works best with a smallish number of database connections. The default value for max connections is 100. So that's the maximum number of concurrent client connections that are allowed for your entire Postgres instance. You can modify that, absolutely. But creating and destroying database connections is expensive. So you don't want to keep doing that, but also keeping many, many connections open that aren't actually needed is expensive. So on most systems, you don't want to include increase max connections above more than a few hundred. If your application genuinely does need more connections than that, although preferably not 45,000, you'll probably want to look at connection pooling. You can even use separate, different size pools for different purposes. Spoiler, they didn't really need 45,000. Next, how to avoid problems. Read the documentation. The documentation for Postgres is extensive, searchable, highly detailed, and nicely updated. You can find the answer to most of your questions in the docs. Oops, sorry. So I've included links to the documentation in lots of the previous slides so that you can go away. Sorry, did you have questions over there in the third row? Excuse me? Did you have questions? Yes. I can just hear you talking. Okay. Um, so I've included links to the documentation in almost all of my slides so that you can go away and have a look at things. If you replace current with the major version that you're actually using, then you can find information for your version. Leticia did a very good talk called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Postgres Documentation, where she explains um, how you'll find and where you'll find all the things you might want to find in there. I highly recommend that you go and have a look at that. And I think it's recorded somewhere. We'll see. No, you'll have to do it again so it can be recorded. And you can help make the docs better. At the bottom of every page of the documentation, there is this little submit connection, uh, submit correction part. It says if you see anything in the documentation that's not correct, doesn't match your experience with the particular feature, or requires further clarification, please use this form to report a documentation issue. And it'll give you a form like this that you can fill in. You don't need to put very much information in there, and that will go to the mailing list, start a discussion, and um, help to improve things. Avoiding problems can be so easy. Just ask. Ask questions. You can get questions answered on the mailing lists with a fairly quick turnaround sometimes and find information that you didn't know existed. But the only stupid question is the one you should have asked and didn't. And now your server's on fire, the CTO is breathing down your neck, and you're going to have to cancel your dinner reservation. 
Another client example. What happens if I set temp file limit to zero? Don't, just stop. There are so many different places that you can ask questions. So as Stacy said, you can ask on the mailing list. So if you go here, you will see the list of mailing lists. I haven't included the list because it is huge. You can find mailing lists um, specifically for newbies. So you can ask any question, however silly it might seem to you. You can go to the hackers mailing list. There are language specific mailing lists, tool specific mailing lists, everything you could possibly think about. If you want to ask a question related to Postgres, you'll find a list to ask it. There's also a Postgres Slack. It's not an official community recognized resource, but you will find a lot of Postgres experts there who are happy and willing to share their time and knowledge to answer questions. There's a Postgres Wiki. And if you like reading blogs about Postgres, there is Planet Postgres, which is a blog aggregator, which aggregates blogs from, and I did mean to look up how many, but many different um, Postgres experts, Postgres community members, people that love Postgres and talk about it. And there are talk, uh, talk recordings. This is far from an exhaustive list. It's the ones that we personally know about. So um, PostgreSQL Europe has um, a YouTube channel where you'll be able to see talk recordings for previous PGConf EUs. Once they're published, you'll see the ones for this conference. Um, some for some of the one day PostgreSQL Europe events as well. Uh, PGUS has a YouTube channel where they post their talk recordings and the SF Pug post the recordings of all of their talks. And if that's not enough Postgres, you can look in these places too and many, many more. Questions? Anybody? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stacey and Karen. We have some time for some questions, so anybody? Seems like you explained everything. <laughs> anyway, uh, you can find Karen and Stacey around the hall. We've put the link there to the feedback. Um, as Magnus said in his opening, we're bribing people to give feedback this year. So the more feedback you give, the more likely you are to receive a free ticket for next year's PGConf EU. Um, so give uh, feedback for the conference as a whole once that opens and give feedback for individual talks and, well, mainly help the speakers and the organizers to know what we've done well, what we can do better, but also, you know, try and try and get a free ticket. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.